Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks very much to those of you who are able to, to join us. Um, this is our first Reba Studio Tutor Symposium. Um, I'm Joanna Parry from the Reba Education Team, um, and I help manage the partnership with Oxford Brooks um, for, for Reba Studio. Um, today's the first in a series of talks, um, and I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Toby Smith, who you can see as Jackie on your screen, uh, but it is Toby, uh, who's the design subject leader for Reba Studio, uh, and also Michael Spooner, um, who is a program alumnus and now a design examiner also for Reba Studio. And they're going to be presenting today on the topic of what is design and what is iteration. Um, in terms of housekeeping, if you can mute yourself during the presentation, please, uh, and note that we are recording. Um, we welcome questions and we'd ask you today to put those into the chat function, please. Um, and then Maria Farroni, our programme director, is here today and she'll be sort of moderating those questions and posing them to Michael and Toby after the presentation. Uh, so over to Michael and Toby to get started. Thank you. Fantastic. OK, so Michael, are you able to share screen now? Great. OK, so um, thank you, Karen. Uh, Joe, that's great. Um, and um, and it's lovely to be able to start off the, this um, series of talks over a, a coming week. Um, welcome to What is Design, which is the, the first in this a series of the Tudor Symposium. I think there's something missing. And um, just to say, you know, uh, as Joe said, I'm uh, Toby Smith. I'm the lead for design on the RBA studio. Um, I'm also a practicing architect and uh, I'm in Unit G at Brooks um, for the last 12 years. And I guess that I'm here to talk about this because I'm passionate about the design process and all the implications of that and, and how it ties together everything that an architect does. Michael. And hi, um, Toby and I have agreed to uh, do this as a double act, so please bear with us. And if I'm a touch nervous, it's because I see I've got a couple of my own students watching. Um, so um, <laughs> nice, nice, nice to meet the rest of you as well. Um, and I hope you all find this of um, some benefit. So yeah, it'll probably be about 30 minutes, I guess, um, that we will be um, talking about. And I hope to provide a little bit of the um, behind the scenes um, uh, insights into the implications, interaction, and hopefully the learning that goes on as part of the, the design process. So that's how we're structuring things. So we're going to alternate between the two of us and probably um, overlap at different times and so on. So um, as a starting point, what is a symposium? What are we doing here? And, um, you know, it's a really posh word, which sort of sounds really uh, official and we kind of connect it with ideas of research and so on. But actually, the definition of it is is a convivial discussion, you know, preferably with a coffee cup in hand and um, after an evening's entertainment, possibly. And um, as a place to 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 meet and discuss and to explore different ideas. And um, so this hopefully um, this discussion this first uh, session is one of many and will kind of spread out and exploring the whole world of architecture. Uh, a def definition of um, obviously the, the, the thrust of today is to talk about and try to tease out um, just what we mean by design. Now, of course, as, as students in practice, generally, uh, you'll have um, You'll have you'll have an interpretation of this, and you'll no doubt have a lot of skills and experience in uh, certain professional, real-world aspects of design. I think this gives, and it will give you, a tremendous advantage to what happens in traditional schools of architecture. Um, but the noticeable difference, of course, is that you are not operating within a formal studio culture, which brings us on to studio, it, the place where sort of the behind the scenes action is. Um, this is where the, 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 the messiness, uh, the imprecision, um, no doubt the mistakes of design take place. Now, in the case of a, a full-time student, that would tend to be um, in, a, in, in a studio environment surrounded by peers. Uh, in your cases, it's more likely than not to be um, possibly at your pay, place of work, but probably around, around the kitchen table. So carrying on with this um, sort of behind the scenes wizardry, um, we're going to go through this design process, which often can be a bit messy and look at behind the scenes. And uh, so whilst Michael's talking about the, the behind the scenes, I'm going to try and pin down what is design by talking about the way in which it works, the recognisable kind of stages in the in, in the in, in 
in the process and and how to approach that design challenge. Um, and I guess so the first thing to uh, understand is that design isn't a thing. It's a process. It's a behavior or an attitude and learning how the process works and how to design is tricky because somehow the process manages to evade a direct head on approach, somehow always sliding out of reach just when you think you know what you're doing. And part of this is the fundamental contradiction that, that lurks behind design, because we all know we need to be loose and free and playful and creative and um, and able to look for connections between new things and finding associations between things. And yet at the same time, we're trying to deal with the hard evidence that, and research and knowledge we need to make decisions. Um, and we know that every playful line that we draw, every mark that we make, reflects something physical, something real, something with substance, you know, the edge of a piece of steel, the, the weight of, of, of brickwork, and, and all of then the, the physical implications that go with that. And maybe all of the cultural associations that go with that and the economic associations that go with that. So the you know, somehow that playfulness is kind of to some extent really difficult because we're trying at the same time to 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 let go of something that's that's really um, visceral that we're kind of really aware of. And we know that also that our designs are going to be assessed for, in terms of their success. Uh, by how appropriate they are relative to all of the implications of the work. So here we are saying, oh, we've got to be really playful, go and experiment and try all these things. It doesn't matter. And at the same time, we're saying it does matter. And we know that it matters and it matters a lot. So simultaneously holding these two conflicting positions in your head and moving between them is, is kind of mental gymnastics of what the design process is all about. Somehow selective memory or even self-deception is somehow necessary um, with the very real risk that we also forget that we've done that. So we approach design sideways, crabwise and curious. Uh, otherwise, whatever we design, be it a building or a coat or an experience, we will only end up with a reflection of our assumptions or an image of the challenge that we're trying to solve. So instead, we need to think beyond the tangible substance of the design or the end product of the design process and consider the people and the experience and use. So if you want to design a house, you need to forget houses and think how you want to live. If you want to design a school, you need to forget schools and think about how you felt as a child and wished it was different. So putting aside what we think we know, research and actually finding things out is an essential first step in the design process. Looking at books and magazines, research papers, websites, movies, exhibitions, asking people and being careful to avoid the trap of their assumptions too and by actively experimenting and drawing conclusions from the results, be they playful and experiential or numeric and scientific. So we investigate and explore the context of our projects and ideas, including physical properties of what people want and need and the technical requirements. And then also the less tangible things like history and memory and tradition, culture, society, sensations, emotion, experience. So how do we work this out uh, on site or, or, or in the studio? Um, often it's going back to that one to one experience. Um, uh, we can get stuck. We, we can get stuck through a process of drawing or researching. And, and often it comes down to working things out, problem solving, uh, weaving in these considerations, um, starting with the human body, um, starting with the actual site and its context. And that's obviously in all shapes and sizes um, that bodies come in. Um, Toby touched on uh, the line and the implication that um, uh, drawings have. So it's connecting what we're doing, what we're drawing to representing actual materials, actual connections, actual junctions. So as an example here, working through how materials might come together um, to form a construction component where thresholds are formed. But this has a, a knock on effects of, for example, how's it put together? 
how's it procured? How's it eventually disassembled? So this idea that lines have meaning and connect it back to back to the body and back to scale. And and then in that, that process of trying to lose our assumptions or preconceptions, you know, we recognize that, you know, children have a real advantage somehow. Uh, that ability to see things fresh, um, to see things from a new perspective, curious to find out what it's all about without making assumptions or without making too many assumptions. And this attitude and habit of open mindedness and curiosity and uh, making no assumptions are the key key things to successful design. And if you can take wide eyed enthusiasm and curiosity with you into every project, you're already halfway there. And then from that process of putting aside our assumptions and going and finding things out, whatever we discover, we then find out really what we should be designing. We somehow, you know, we start with an initial kind of question of maybe what we've been asked to do or, or um, maybe a tutor or maybe in a real project and a client and they say, OK, oh, this is what I want. And then actually through the process of research, you discover what it is that you're really what the problem really is through the conversation with the client and understanding their, their needs, but also understanding the context of that project. So from that, we then draw this thing, you know, the brief that somehow frames those project ambitions and experience. And at the same time, also captures this thing, which is often referred to, but I suspect not so well understood, of the idea of a critical position, that the project itself actually takes an attitude and it says, right, not only do I recognize that this is a challenge that needs to be addressed, but actually this is my opinion on that thing and this is the way in which we're going to do it. And framing that brief in a clear, preferably graphic kind of way allows you to then explore that and, and discuss that with everybody else involved in the project to hone that and to take that forward. And it gives us that thing that then we can test our ideas against. And, and we can gauge the success of actually what we design against this thing. So bringing us back into the studio and how do we how do we test these ideas? Obviously, uh, working through uh, scales is essential um, as pro progressing through the Reba studio, particularly into part two, sites will tend to perhaps become more ambitious in, in scale and complexity and grappling with scale and managing scale and how we work through scales is essential to um, ex to an exploration as part of a iterative design process process and in addition to to the, to the, to the physical scale um, there's also the 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 activity so the the trying doing documenting in in, in this case a, uh, a a street demonstration um, of a project and precisely the activity. So there's something there's something in the behind the scenes doing that's uh, critical to the design process. And not only is it how we engage, but it's also recognizing that we that the that our first idea probably isn't going to work, and that we have to try lots of lots of things. And so. This next step in some ways in the design process is, is the hardest one where we have to be kind of brave and we have to express our opinion and we have to put something out there. And at the same time, we have to let ourselves be experimental, be foolish, kind of just see what comes and not to worry about it too much, to, to play that game of a selective um, memory and put aside maybe some of the implications in order to just kind of say, well, what if? What if it's like this? Maybe it's like this. And by trying many different things, we can then find the ones that maybe look like they're more connected, maybe that they that they are relevant. And we can also start to discard the ones that we realize are, are not going to be relevant. And that in some ways is incredibly helpful to us as again, understanding what the parameters of a project is. And one of the hardest parts of this is also that our initial ideas, the way we express them first, is often incredibly ugly, uh, not very sophisticated, and 
and so we're embarrassed about showing those things and uh, we're you know we're yearning for that uh, elegance and sophistication that that we see in final end of product projects but actually the early stages it's not like that it just it doesn't work that way um and and so we have to kind of just accept that that's the nature of it sort of overcome our uh, bashfulness if you like um in order to reveal the things that we really we're thinking and and have an open conversation and the next sort of part of that is then to recognize that we can't do everything at once we if we try to do everything all at the same time we'll get into trouble with our assumptions because the only way to resolve something you know, something as interconnected and complicated complex as uh, designing a building or, or, or whatever it, it would be to kind of then just fall back on what we already know so to avoid doing that the 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 trick is to break that brief down into fragments into manageable pieces at a range of different scales so whilst they might be fragments of the project that doesn't mean that they're all individual little components that are bolted together some might be vast at the scale of infrastructure and the uh, the city and others might be ideas and fragments at the scale of personal experience and how you touch them and 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 what it feels like and we also know at this early stage in a project where we're trying to manage those fragments that there are lots of things we don't know and so we have to introduce this idea of a placeholder this idea of a of a stand in a prop that's just going to make do for now we know that that thing is going to change uh, as the, our ideas develop as the project develops so when you first framing all of those the, the fragments of a project quite a lot of them are kind of stand in props and actually there's only one that you're really examining and then slowly you'll work your way through those things you discover the complexities and the contradictions of the project so in the in 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 the studio it's it's a case of s selecting uh, appropriate fragments that are that are exploring those particular moments that are critical to your project. Um, no different to choosing a section in a way that is going to actually capture the issues that are critical to the project. And then exploring these through different scales, through different materials, um, bringing two dimensional work to life through three dimensional fragments. So in this instance, moments of an envelope that negotiates an interaction between the interior and the exterior between people and the occupants and between other species. And of course, the way to do that, to develop it, whether you have a, a workshop or a garage or a shed at the end of the garden or the kitchen, and I've seen some fantastic models made over lockdown in kitchens, um, um, and that might give you some ideas for the materials. Um, we, we explore this through the making and testing in two dimensions, three dimensions, and hopefully eventually in four dimensions, which I'll come on to shortly. So the next um, the next uh, behind the scene uh, strategy um, to, to take these fragments and uh, explore them and interrogate them is to uh, look simultaneously by shifting through different projections. So clearly we see an activity here described simultaneously through the different orthogonal projections uh, rich with inhabitation, rich with annotation. And just another example here. So slightly, perhaps slightly more polished work, but representative of a design process that is working simultaneously through different projections and perspectives, including first person and including the interior. Um, in parallel with this uh, uh, is, is the unearthing of, of the stories that should underpin the project and establishing a design narrative. So this, this goes hand in hand. This isn't simply setting up a mechanistic um, dissection of, a, of, of an object. Um, this, is, this is embedding the, the stories and the characters and how they relate to a context and a bigger picture, which should all go back to that concept that we discussed before. Now I mentioned, I mentioned working in a fourth dimension. This is a really important uh, 
aspect of the design process, especially for those projects that fly just that much higher and have that much more meaning. So it's working through all aspects and some some of your professional experience will be very familiar with this. So, for example, how is it procured? How is it going to be erected? How is it eventually going to be dismantled? So you could say this comes from almost somewhat dry CDM, but these are very practical considerations going back to those lines having meaning. Someone actually having to handle a very large piece of building component, put it into place. But it's also about how how do these materials perform over time? How do they weather? How do they interact with the environment? How do they interact with vegetation? Again, more on that in a moment. But also exploring through this fourth dimension how your proposals work, say, over the course of the day, the day in the life. How do they operate between day and night? Of course, how do they respond to the seasons, <laughs> to weather patterns, to different scales of permanence? So having sort of done that he looked at all of these fragments in different ways at different scales different dimensions different projections all the things that, that uh, michael's talking about you know what we need to then look for is is the glue that holds it all together we slowly build up the ideas of the design um, from these many fragments starting to come together and recognize those that have a connection with each other and eventually we arrive with this kind of strange bag of bits um, and not so much that kind of ties them together maybe and 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 the glue that ties them together the thing that we that we start looking for is we give them hierarchy we start deciding which ones are more important which ones you need to experience first we start to draw them together in a in a coherent whole looking for those ideas that connect them together that word a concept and that's a funny thing you know we word conceptual thinking you see it here all the time um you, your, your tutor will be talking about you know the concepts behind your project and actually mm, i'm not so sure that everybody knows really what that word even even means um you know it's a it's a it's a strange uh it's a, it's a word where it's kind of tacit knowledge somehow but actually is it really examined in terms of what we are what we're talking about um and and where does it come from you know, it's 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 really tricky. One of the things with the with also with all of this is that the sequence just isn't fixed. So the steps aren't linear, and concepts emerge. Some might you might have right at the beginning of a project might have a, a an idea that might be fundamental that ties everything together right at the beginning, or you might not, and that might come right at the end after you've looked at lots and lots of different steps and stages. Some will come out of the research, some concepts will come out of the critical position and the agenda. Some may come out as you're doing the final drawings and you kind of realize, oh, I hadn't realized even that these two things are somehow connected. And, uh, and, and, and then that changes your mind, that changes the way in which you approach that thing, you frame it a different way. So the I guess, so, but to ask that question, what, what is a concept? You know, how do we define that? And um, I think the key thing to say is that concepts are not about what things look like. Concepts are about how things work. And consider the difference between something that looks like a wave uh, as opposed to something that's informed by the principles and experience of wave action. One of those things is simply the image of a wave. It's a facsimile and has no knowledge of that wave. It has no understanding of that wave. It just looks like it. The other thing that's been embodied, it embodies the real nature of the wave by understanding how the wave works, and how it might be experienced and what it feels like. Well, that's a, that's a totally different thing. And the interesting thing is that a design that emerges using conceptual ideas based upon how things work could look like a wave in this context. But the understanding behind that wave will be completely different. It will be at a much greater level of depth. And, and this is really the thing, is it's also perfectly possible to come up with a design that doesn't look like a wave, but builds upon the ideas of how the wave operates and how it experienced and, and what it means. And it's this ability to generate a design that is 
in some ways independent of the original source of, of, of inspiration and independent of that um, uh, reference that gives a conceptual idea its power. It's independent from thing and it becomes uh, an idea that can then take you to somewhere new and allows you an open-ended way of interpreting um, what the implications of that thing are. So we, we, we treasure these things, these conceptual ideas, because they allow us to connect up all of the different aspects of a design and to relate it to things that seem really important, the, the, the drivers behind a design project, at the same time without having to make it the project look like those things. It can be informed by it, but it doesn't have to look like it. It can become itself. And, and this is absolutely fundamental as a, a, a sort of step in, in architecture. But it, in the studio, <laughs> <laughs> around your kitchen table in your bedroom wherever that is the, this this artifact that i want to pause on which is absolutely it, it's exquisite it's really sublime and it, it, it even looks better better in color um the, the things have to be done in the in the studio to take those concepts those models and go back and test them um test them to the activity test them to the scale so here's another equally exquisite concept model maybe it's a, con a moment in this particular project but just bringing in the 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 human body and those activities ideally some context as well suddenly starts to ground it and give you something to to motor on with your project so again it's a, a, maybe a piece of a, advice i hear myself often repeating when you when you do find that sublime moment that encapsulation of your idea and it could be very gestural or it could be something that's been lovingly carved or looked after printed and honed down but once you find it you need to also not just test it but but continually remind yourself of it so there's nothing it's nothing worse than having a really beautiful object and then the project doesn't live up to those potentials so i like to say if if a project's about color and dynamism and, and and activity and all the excitement that the this reclaimed fun fair project suggests and this is really encapsulating something of the mood in the moment there's this ideas of scale and context where it sits then you need to remind yourself of that so it becomes becomes almost a guiding a guiding principle so it's something to keep your eye on in the studio on the wall at the corner of your desk and then what do you have to do? The next step is to is to that testing process, that exploring how does it work? Why does it work? Developing these fragments further and further. And what we're doing here is we're, we're going through the iterative process of, of trying something, reflecting on the successes or the failures of that thing, and then making an adjustment and then trying it again and then reflecting on the successes of that and then adjusting it again and doing that again and again and again and at different scales and at different sets of connections between the different fragments so that when we move from maybe from drawing to modeling and from modeling then to drawing in 3d and then from drawing in 3d to drawing in 2d and then to modeling again that somehow that process of testing is always telling us something new it's not just repeating itself. We're finding something out and adjusting and changing not only the thing, but also the context and the way in which we understand it each time that we work through it. And I think that this is one of those things where um, quite often see people talking about, oh yeah, I've done lots of iterations of the project and that may well be true. They might have done um, you know, five or six different versions of a design, but actually the iterative process is also taking place in the middle of the you drawing a plan, in the middle of you drawing a section, because you're actually, you're drawing it and then you're going, oh no, what if I join that bit? What if I change that? And you're doing that iterative process at a different scale, simultaneously as you're trying to capture your ideas, that the act of drawing, the act of modeling is the iteration as much as the reflection and the, the bigger things that we're looking at afterwards. So over and over again, we're kind of going through this testing, reflecting, adjusting 
I could repeat it hundreds of times. I'm going to stop. <laughs> um, well, now maybe the bad, <laughs> the bad news, which tends to happen in, in, in the depths of the night when you're working away and you, you get you get stuck. Um, it's this it's this realization and it, it, it's very blunt. Um, but it is a vital part of iteration. It's and I like uh, Soichiro Honda's quote. No doubt he took it from someone somewhere else. And I'm sure Albert Einstein said something a bit more tactful. But this idea that success is 99% failure, uh, which may feel like a, 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 a difficult pill to swallow. Um, but it is the point that we need to go through and get past these blocks when something isn't working. We need to try something different. And whether that's something you bring about through yourself, uh, inspiration through conversations with other, conversations with uh, your tutor or a mentor, something that maybe unlocks it could be a chance encounter um but we need to find ways because it's inevitable that you will encounter failure so there's a lot of a lot of perspiration behind the inspiration the other thing we need to um, balance throughout all this again this is sort of the the bit that maybe we're not told at the outset as part of the design process and particularly for those on the part two, you'll be expected to, to grapple with sort of this, um, these wicked problems of uh, contradictions and how you negotiate these contradictions, which you are no doubt familiar with in your professional, um, you know, in your professional life on day to day. You've got the structural engineers wanting one thing and the services wanting this and the daylight and this, that and the other. And you're trying to rein it all in. So there is something about managing these negotiations. And those negotiations aren't just through um, different physical aspects of, of the real world, um, but they may be creative. They may be negotiations between different individuals, or different communities or different neighbors. Uh, or in the case of these really lovely examples from Toby's studio, um, I can't take credit for these at all, um, are these uh, negotiations between different media. So there's a negotiation between the physical model and then the drawn model and then the annotations. So that's that's sort of the a second behind the scenes aspect of it. And of course, hopefully, as part of the design process, no matter where it's happening, but particularly in the design studio, it's how you it's how you manage and respond to feedback. Um, and how you do that proactively, how you do it positively. Um, how you learn to defend your own position if perhaps you there's something you disagree with, um, and it's make, it, it, it's making sure that becomes part of the process. So, principally, it'll be conversations with your your design tutor, but by all means, it can be happening. Hopefully, will happen amongst yourselves as peers, amongst your colleagues at work, with your mentor. Um, and just to put 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 a, 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 a small pitch out there. Um, Miro, for example, for me, has been a silver lining to to teaching online during the pandemic. I think Reba Studio students were already uh, sort of uh, ahead of the game when it came to this learning through distance. But collaborative tools, we can interact with with a student in their work in a collaborative way, um, can be a real positive to the learning process. Um, and in addition to these, I'll. I'll so sort of, sort of a, a run of these challenges, I guess, as, as, we, as we work through things. But it's it's how we weave in and how you weave into your design projects, the very, very real consequences that the architect has to juggle and manage um, the eth ethical consequences um, for people and planet. So how your projects respond to not only legislative context, and, but also moral responsibilities. So indeed, you shouldn't just be mitigating these things. You should speculatively within the Reba studio be endeavoring to positively influence them um, and hope, hopefully improve improve uh, improve circumstances uh, globally as well as as well as locally so uh, an example just one example here um, student work looking at how buildings um, are integrated, they're embedded in, in an ecological context. They're part of a wider system, uh, whether it's other species, whether it's it, it's climate and environment, whether it's energy, obviously carbon. Um, um, this is fortunately all very topical when we think of education declares um, and, and our, our climate.
climate objectives of 2050. Um, but that sort of inclusivity, diverseness, richness, that should really run through projects. Um, so projects not being seen as crafted objects, but connected to these wider systems. A jigsaw puzzle that is interconnected with its network, absolutely, is the, you know, or then this is what's, what your way you're trying to get to, is to bring all of those components together so that all the parts of the jigsaw somehow make sense, make sense with that wider context that, that uh, Michael's talking about, at the same time as making spatial sense, making social sense, making your cultural sense, as they how they interconnect together, making technical sense, and 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 so that the, everything comes together to work in concert, and at multiple scales, so that the things that are happening outside the buildings and outside of the design are somehow reflected and making sense of what's going on inside. And the success of a great project is where you see those links and where they become kind of palpable. And we just, you know, I think we intuitively react to those in an incredibly positive way it's kind of a, a moment of delight and joy when you you realize that there is this this sense of connection and and everything kind of making sense somehow or, or that even if it seems juxtaposed and extraordinary that somehow it somehow makes sense that that juxtaposition isn't gratuitous that it's part of it and this is really the conclusion where we're trying to where we're trying to get to where all aspects of the project are working together and so we could say, you know, crab wise, design wise, we've kind of sneaked up on an end goal. We've arrived at something that could be put forward as a, a satisfying final design. And that might be um, explored through models and drawings and, and sketches and so on. But maybe the one thing that we've um, talked more about uh, is design and a bit less about is buildings and one of the reasons for this is really that architecture isn't about buildings instead architecture and buildings buildings are the byproduct of architecture and the design process they're the physical things that everybody sees and associates with architecture but that's not the architecture the architecture is what architects do it's how they think and work and test and develop ideas. So I think this is our penultimate slide. It's it's just reinforcing what Toby said. It's this idea that architecture is is the backdrop to living. It's the it's bringing together at scale the inhabitation, the materiality, ideas of permanence and weathering and experience. And this is what this is what a well-rounded project should be. Bringing, bringing it, closing it after all those pincer movements into something that has, has a completeness um, and where open-endedness insofar as possible has been avoided. So there we go. So uh, as a starting point, architecture is, is a particular attitude or approach to the process, design process that generates all of this wonderful stuff that we've seen on the slides and the, the models and the drawings, the paintings, the poetry, the stories, the, the narrative, the sculpture, all of this stuff. And about it's connected to people and it's connected to time and it's connected to um, how we see ourselves in the world. It's how we see our responsibilities in the world. And it's also connected to ideas of purpose. And I guess it's inevitable then that, you know, when we're teaching design and when we're assessing design, um, that the focus is, is on this process and these attitudes, maybe known as sometimes referred to as the receptors, um, which are the, the core of, uh, of, of the, that we're really looking for. Um, and so if design projects continuously explore and respond to the, these fundamental ideas of place and people and purpose and spatial experience, um, then even if you don't actually design a building, don't worry, this is architecture. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so I think the way it's going to work is that um, we would like you to let's you know, to open the conversation. There's obviously a, a, a vast conversation of things we can talk about and processes and steps and so on. And um, and if 
people could um, put their questions into the chat, then Maria will read those questions and then Michael and I will attempt to provide some answers or, or maybe just open the conversation and see, see where it goes. Well, while we're waiting for questions, why don't I just uh, start, start as a catalyst? Um, those are just re really beautiful uh, images and uh, over with the speaking happening there. And, and that is architecture too. It's really interesting. Do you want to say a little bit about the difference between a concept and an idea? Could do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, I think this is this is a really fundamental thing, and I actually think it's quite straightforward. So um, an idea is is a mental image of something. It's it's a, it it could take almost any form, um, but in some ways it's singular. Uh, a concept is about the things that connect. It's about the, the, the it's about the, the the that idea that you might see in the singular when it's then presents itself in multiple form, expresses itself in different ways, but there is an underlying thread. So a concept is that thing that lurks in the background that ties together multiple things. And that's one way of looking at it. But, um, maybe it's a bit simplistic. No. But, I think it's helpful because it, it helps to align a lot of the images that you showed for people who are seeing them because mm. some of them were more towards development of an idea and somewhere earlier in the concept. So it's mm. a way to kind of um, gather that together. But I'm going to ask one more question and then I hope everybody else will ask. But as tutors, um, when you're working with your students, how do you trigger that? How do you trigger either the, if someone, if the student is stuck either on the conceptual idea or the shift from conceptual to to an idea for a proposal. What are some of the tricks? I mean, it's very hard to say generally because it's so unique, but so so students have a sense of what's going on in the tutor's mind, all the students listening today. I can say, let, let Michael go first, but I've got a thought. I, I, I'm still thinking about the ideas and the concept question, but um, <laughs> that feels easier now. <laughs> Getting unstuck. I think I, I think I almost wanted to disagree at one point with with Toby about the concept. I, I don't think I don't think the concept earlier on you say you're saying you know it can almost come at any point, and I, I might be paraphrasing, but I think that's true to a degree. And I think concepts can sort of t turn on their head because a concept for me is a salute. It's a solution which has a certain buy-in on maybe a poetic level, a practical level, a emotional intellect, what have you. Um, where you know, whereas the ideas are just, oh, could be that, could be that. So we try out lots of ideas as an iterative process, and then we get to that. But I think the concept can be a bit like an iceberg. You know, it can they shift dramatically, icebergs. They they pivot, and it's still maybe the same. You know, it looks like mm. sort of similar entity. So I. Having said that, I think the concept does have to arrive. I think you need something underpinning your project, and I think it, it, I think that's where students and myself can get stuck when we feel we're in the world of a lot of research and mapping and all that safe stuff and collating information, um, and that that becomes a safe space. Um, and, and and the concept does need to be it needs to be given a good kick around because really the ideas are hypotheses and the concept is a working solution and that solution might go through some gravitational shifts as it melts and thaws and refreezes. Um, so I, I guess getting unstuck that's that's a, probably a whole talk on itself. But for me, uh, for me, and it's interesting there are a couple of my students. Um, uh, on the chat, so I'd be interested to hear their view. You know, I, I design for me is something of a muscle that we don't exercise enough in design schools. And when you have something as large as the the the, the D four, the D six, these big projects with a lot weighing on, a lot of expectation, I I can say from experience of feeling that stress. And actually, a way to break through is just do small design projects, small. You know, maybe it's a concept for a fragment of the project. Maybe maybe it's breaking down and work doing something at one to one or one to five, or maybe it's something doing something at an urban or a landscape scale. 
So I think the I think charrettes, design charrettes, quick tasks, setting a deadline and going through and working something out. So it could be designing that bit of the envelope or an opening or a threshold, or it could be, you know, but it's doing something that's um, propositional that I think that's the way for me to get unstuck, whether that helps answer the question about when you can't come up with a concept i'm not sure but um anyway i probably said a lot on that without but i think i i and i think that that we do i think one thing you know go to go back to maria's question directly is like what tactics as tutors do we engage with to kind of help students get unstuck i think the classic thing that we do and i think we do it absolutely intuitively all the time and we don't even think about it because it's part of the process of being a tutor is we make connections we're constantly going oh there's a precedent here's a reference here's a thing that somebody else has already done oh have you realized that you know these things are related to each other and, and then to go and talk about those things we're just looking for those connections all the time because if we can encourage a student to go and look at those connections and explore them for themselves then they will see a route out of that being stuck pretty quickly, just simply from that thing. So that that barrage of references that the that, that tutors give to students and, you know, often a crit can be quite an exhausting experience for a student. It's kind of like all of this stuff being thrown at them. Oh, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. Why not, you know, that that's actually, in a way, it is part of that unsticking process of just seeing the potential in the ideas. The other one, and I think it's the opposite for me, and maybe as somebody who talks far too much, so maybe this is kind of what I'm going to say is inevitable, but I find the act of explaining something to somebody tells me things about what I was doing that I didn't see when I wasn't talking. So when I'm looking at the drawing, I go, oh, yeah, that all works. And then you present that same drawing to someone, you try and explain what it is you're doing, and the act of doing it, you kind of go, oh, but that doesn't work, does it? Oh, but if I change that, oh, that I can make, and suddenly you're off, you've got a, you've got a, something comes out of it. And this is where tutorials are incredibly important. So, you know, student must be taking advantage of those opportunities to say, this is what I'm doing, this is why I'm doing it, this is how it works but also to talk to each other outside of that, to explain to anybody who will listen. And of course, our RBA studio is the one thing that's trickiest is you're not in the studio. So you're not sharing space with other students. You haven't got somebody on your shoulder going, what are you up to? What's going on? And that it, needing to explain to them what it is that's going on is part of the process of getting unstuck. And, and, I, and I, I know, and I, what I would say is use the office use any audience you can possibly find to just say this is what I'm doing and that act of talking about it and explaining it I find incredibly uh, helpful. I, I've got can I, can I chip in a bit more I know it's such a big topic we all want to get unstuck in our own <laughs> professional practice but a couple of things you touched on one is precedence and you do get recommended them and it's 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 finding a way to digest the, the the precedent and engage with it and maybe stick it at the right scale or a different scale or in your context or with the activity all the things we were talking about behind the scenes um so the, one of the best ways of doing this of course is using collage so i find collage to be a great technique it even works on primary student primary age students they love it they can do it we can do it um that's the first thing the second thing is 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 being able to distill ideas through party diagrams so just the simplest the simplest expression give it a go and, and make multiple ones which is partly that just des describing you know when you have to describe it well don't describe it with words get yeah. the pen out yeah the same as you would when you're talking to somebody that, that you're on site and you're trying to say, oh, it goes this bit goes with this bit. What do you do? You grab a piece of paper and you start to draw how those things fit together. And that act of explaining it through the pen, everybody gets it somehow. There's a, you know, whether it's two dimensional or three dimensional thing, it's that somehow. The act of drawing it and explaining it and witnessing that participating in it 
the, the the idea is shared that's what we're trying to do isn't it and that's what knowledge is is actually an idea in one person's head then existing in multiple people's heads in so that you have the same pattern of thought somehow that spreads and, and, and joins us up it's kind of quite extraordinary when you think what that actually is tammy asked um since she's been working in practice she's noticed that in, in so this is a different uh, talk that's coming up in the series, the difference between the academic project and the practice-based project. But since we're mm -hmm. touching on process, she's asking, um, since it's the th senior staff members who are, are really ta tackling the, you know, all of the experience and process work really for the project, mm -hmm. for the practice-based project, um, she finds it difficult because she doesn't have that experience. So I think what she's asking is how does she start practicing that process for the academic project, I think the question is that. I think this. I think this is a time for playfulness to come in, and that was mentioned. You know, there, there's an there's an element of like really kind of unbridled, give it a go, have fun, make a mess. So we've shown images of studios with paper all over the floor, of workshops, of models made out of plaster, out of found objects. You know, it's. And that's that's a real step from okay, we're going to print something out, stick it on card, and get the foam cutter out. Um, you know, it's it is a, it is. So I, I'm trying to say have a bit. I think have a bit of fun. Um, engage with Tammy. I would say engage best you can remotely or ideally in person with schools of architecture, end of year shows, uh, ex, you know, exhibitions, what have you, um, and maybe revisit some of those lost skills that you haven't used for a very long time whether it's sculpting video film making collect what have you weaving um so there's there's an element of i mean i think i i, I think to, to genuinely go into architecture this is the fun bit right I, I think that creative bit so i think with your with your tutor in particular find out what you're curious about or what your strengths are and just absolutely have a go and have it fun and i think if you take the fragment approach and you know, don't overload it like I have to come up with the right concept. But if you see it as building blocks, fragments, then what have you got to lose? I'd like to say to my students, try to, and they'll say, oh, it's unrealistic, Michael. I try to say, set yourself a 60 minute time limit or a two hour time limit, because it's incredible how much you can get accomplished when you've, you've got a timer. But again, working in isolation without a peer group, you know, that's something you'll have to work out how you manage that time. There's an interesting other part to this thing that Tammy's asking, which is to do with money, isn't it? In practice, the thing that the senior partners and principals will be doing is saying, well, this is the amount of time that we can afford to pay to develop this project, because that's the fee that's being generated. And we know to a large extent that the time it takes to draw up a project and to develop the technical stuff is relatively consistent. You know, they're, they're me relatively measurable. But the thinking process and the iterative process is this open ended bit that is really, really difficult to pin down. And it's the bit that gets squeezed. It's the bit that gets pushed out by the economics of the fact that architects work for too little money and all the rest of it. And so the opportunity you have as a student is to redress that balance and to recognize that actually the best work is going to come out of putting the time into that bit of the work of the iterative process of developing the ideas of being playful doing all the things that michael's talking about and recognizing that that's one of the key things that's going to differentiate the nature of your work it's simply that you can give it that time and then try lots of different things in different ways and, and not feel that you're Nobody's ever going to kind of hold you to account and say, oh, you did it that way last week, so you've now got to carry on doing it like that forever. It's like, no, I, 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 you know, it's your project. You always have the right to kind of go, hmm, that's no good. I'm going to do something completely different. And I'm learning from that thing. And actually, I now know what I don't want to do. And it's not going to be like that and go and do something else. And it's, and it's that, that taking ownership of the process which differentiates between being a student of architecture as opposed to working in practice where maybe you don't own the process in quite the same way. So. Um, 
there's a couple of questions. Uh, Constantina, uh, um, when, when making, when developing the conceptual ideas, conceptual connections, she's saying it's quite subjective. So how do you know when it's making sense to someone else? Or I think what she's saying, how do you know when it's a good idea or a good connection? And, um, and then I'm going to give you the second question too, because I think they're linked. And Sharika asked, um, how do you know when the work is progressing and you're not just stuck on an idea? I think they're linked, the two questions. How do you know when you're, you're just not chasing your tail in a way? I'm just changing her, <laughs> paraphrasing her. Um, the subjective thing, that's a, let's start there, because I think that's really interesting. Uh, uh, um, I think it's an illusion to imagine that design is objective at all. There are objective things that we can measure. There are empirical things that we can test for and we can demonstrate in compliance with structural requirements and, and, and all of those kinds of things. But at a, a, a conceptual level, at an ideas level, the, the success of that is often simply to do with, well, how well does it tie things together? And the really strange thing is, I think, that we generally have a, an intuitive understanding of this, that when something works, we kind of, it has a, a feeling of being complete. It feels like the ideas fit together neatly and everything makes sense with itself. It's not because they're objectively measurably well, then maybe they are. I've not, there's an interesting project. Can you actually measurably demonstrate that all of those empirical things are actually improved in, in concert in something when it really works successfully, as opposed to appearing to do so or feeling right? I guess I'm maybe more of an intuitive thinker and designer, and I would trust my gut. And if it feels like it's right, then it's probably right. Um, I don't know. I, I so 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 there's there's some there's something in, in, in that um, often you you know you'll come to I'm thinking about like a tutorial and a student and, and and thinking about a project that and you're talking it through and it's all really interesting but it doesn't quite feel right and you can't quite put your finger on what it is and it's because things haven't fully meshed and locked and somehow that the ideas aren't reinforcing each other that they feel sort of somehow disparate disconnected in some way and so you're looking to again to find those links to kind of adjust it so things work together i don't think that's an objective connection i think that is a subjective one um but as I say, I'm kind of interested in the idea of the objective measurability of is that also true? Is it spatially more efficient? Did it cost less to build? Was it did, you know, did it use less energy? Well, did, was it easy, better to use because all of those ideas felt right? I don't know. <clears throat> yeah, can I? If I do, we have a moment. We still have a little yes. bit of time if I can respond um, because I, I think. I mean, I think there is a lot of objectivity or should be a lot of objectivity in design. And I like to think of us as these blue collar creatives who actually have this real responsibility and we don't have the same artistic license as an artist. You know, what we do has serious, serious, serious implications. So what you do each day at work, what you do in a week at work, specifying and designing and whatnot has a huge more impact on the planet. I'm quite confident than the rest of your lifestyle will have over the course of your life. I don't know if it's a week, maybe it's a month, but you, you, you get what I'm saying. It's a huge responsibility. And I think there are, I, th I think it's about reference points. So it might be reference points about efficiencies that, 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 that I think Toby was sort of coming on to, but there's other reference points just like of the context. Um, this is going back directly, you know, into how to make, how to communicate how can you com make sure it makes sense? And that was that step I mentioned. Oh, that's a nice object. That's lovely. I'll use that as a as a paperweight or as a maybe it could be a lampshade. Oh, lovely object. But how do you then translate that to this is something that sits on a warehouse in Hamburg and it, it's 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 a philharmonic, you know, which that would kind of reminded me of. Um, so we do that with these reference points such as scale, body, the context, the north sign, where in the world we're in. Um, so it's all, you know, scale, obviously. 
So a lot of the things that were discussed, I think that's absolutely essential. It's why we can't take something and think that, well, that's really lovely. Well, it is, but we're not product designers. We're not artists. We're not, you know, what what does it translate to? What are the ethical repercussions? So I think, yeah, that's sort of my view on that. I mean, I agree. Toby and I are, and Maria, whoever else in the call, aren't going to agree on do we like that? Do we like that? Do we like, you know, I, I told a colleague yesterday, I thought the tower at Blackfriars, the big, great, tall one that I'm sure a lot of our, that's so lovely and elegant. And she agreed and nodded. She probably hated it. I don't know. But so <laughs> there is there's no doubt there's a there's a subjectivity, but there's an awful lot of objectivity. And actually, the key thing is to bring your audience up to speed by giving them those reference points and also not taking your word for it. So when you say this is going to result in a stunning view, well, show me the view. What's it like inside? You know, or this is going to be comfortable. Demonstrate how it's comfortable through the season. Um, and then coming on to um, Sharika's comment, I think the other one, that's a that's an important point for me because you see often iterative, iterative iterations in the portfolio. Yeah, whole spread. Wow, that must have taken a long time and lovely and whatever else. Um, there's two things there. One is how how robust has that process been? Like, have you really stretched yourself? Have you really thought laterally? And so I'm really often interested in the spread of ideas. But importantly, I'm interested in the criteria that should come out from your brief against which you're able to assess that process. And of course, it's something you should be able to stand up equally with your tutor or an examiner or client and say, you know, how, how arrogant it would be for an architect to say, here's your here's the proposal. You know, this is it. You know, or here's the two I've done. I mean, that sort of arrogance has no place in the profession. You really need to say, look, here's my bookkeeping. These are the criteria. That's the key word I'm trying to say is, is formatting and criteria. So format the iterations and then test them against actual criteria. So we looked at a beautiful model that seemed to suggest lightness and a play of light and sort of solidity and translucency. Well, give those if those are the key things or some of them. But there might be other key drivers around community and how it addresses the street and whatever else. Set your criteria. And then I would say be objective. In, in how you you score it. So I think that's when you know, um, I'm trying to say that you, you've, you've tested the ideas robustly. I hope that answers, or I hope we, between us, we've addressed these two. It's actually wonderful to get very different kind of perspectives. So I just want to say thank you. I think our time is up now. Um, and um, I want to say thank you to the RBA for the last minute setting up everything and advertising. So thank you very much, Joel and Caroline. I want to say a really huge thank you to Toby Smith and Michael Spooner. You are like really um, fantastic tutors in your own right and all that you do. Um, Michael, you've been such a big contributor to the RBA studio in so many different ways. Thank you. And Toby, we have a a really strong sailing ship uh, and the le leader of design on the RB studio. Thank you for taking the time after such a busy year and uh, it's still continuing. Um, I think we will have more time in the next events to invite even more people. Um, our next session is on the 29th um, with uh, Keisha Clark and Ralph Saul. And they'll be talking about uh, year one and launching that. So it'll be really pertinent to a lot of people on the call. Um, so once again, thank you for taking the time for sharing and, um, we really appreciate it. Over to you, Joe. Thank, thanks very much. Yeah. I just want to reiterate thanks to uh, Michael and Toby. That was a really fascinating session. Um, I, I think um, you can see from the questions, everyone, uh, really much, very much enjoyed that. So thank you for your time. Um, yeah, we'll, um, get the next session organized and, and send out the, the details, um, as soon as we can, um, just wish everybody uh, a, a really nice, uh, hopefully relaxing weekend and try and stay cool if you possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Take care, everyone.